From the late 50s to the early 90s, this was home to several thousand bio-warfare specialists, their support staff and families. Voz Arden, bioweapons research testing station, housing complex. So it's gone midday. It took eight hours to get here. I still can't believe it. But what an extraordinary place. This looks, like a, this looks like it has a template. It was clear the Soviets had left in a hurry. But what had they actually done with the huge stocks of weaponized smallpox, the anthrax, the botulinum toxin? And all sorts of just weird stuff going on. <laughs> I don't know what this place was, what those was before. Just like that all over. The buildings you can go in or you feel safe to go in. Most of them have been so badly smashed up, I don't want to actually venture inside because they look potentially dangerous. And when I stop like that, there's a silence that's truly eerie. We left the housing complex and entered the nerve center of the laboratory itself. In these buildings, the Soviets concocted the most virulent strains of bacteria known to man. We made a sinister discovery just inside the door, a respirator lying on the floor. A clear sign that something potentially lethal might be lurking within. rooms were straight from an Orwellian nightmare. I wondered what unfortunate soul had been strapped to that bed. At that moment, a pungently strong smell entered the respirators. Dave, yeah, I can smell, smell urine. Yeah. A few moments later, the unknown chemical still stinging my nostrils, Dave decided we should beat a retreat. I don't, I don't think Unnerved by what we'd seen in the lab, we decided to explore another area of the site. But what we found there was even more disturbing. Right Test tubes, pipettes and petri dishes, thousands and thousands of them. And who could say what evil concoctions they contained? Um, this sort yeah. of feels dangerous to me. But it's a very good indicator of the sort of the, the scale of which they were actually testing uh, various bits and pieces by the sheer quantity that you can see yeah. in this uh, in the store. So have a look down the side here, Nick. Please, something down here. Uh, oh yeah. It's three-dimensional hazards, isn't it? I'm yeah. oh, really nearly brain myself. Yeah, yeah here's, um, here's the breathing apparatus that they used to use. So you just go over the head, and yeah. they probably go to some sort of air-fed system, filtered system, so that they're breathing clean air. This is horrific. It's just terrifying. But there is, I suppose, a bit of an irony in that all the time over the last few years I've spent travelling to the physical extremes of the planet, be it the cold of Siberia, the swamps of Papua, or the heat of Danakil, wherever I've gone, humans have always managed somehow to scrape a living. 
is only here in this squalid plague spot, festering in the heart of another, even larger man-made disaster, that there's no possible way people could live. I mean, there could be anthrax spores in that test tube. This, this place is just too lethal. Too lethal. We still hadn't solved the mystery of what the looters were actually doing on Vos Rosdeny. Were they merely after building materials, or was there something more sinister about their frequent trips to the island? Whatever the case, they definitely weren't telling us. Four hours later, we were back on the boat ride home. For Dave and myself, an escape from the Aral Sea was a simple question of taking the next flight out. But it occurred to me, as I washed away any remaining anthrax spores, that, for the people of the Aral Sea, there is no such escape. Their environment has been mismanaged and mistreated on a catastrophic scale. And if the lessons of the Aral are ignored, the rest of the planet may get the same treatment at the hands of man. Then, like the looters of the Aral, we may all end up scraping a perilous living in a lethally polluted world. <laughs>